Hi, my name is Tim Vaughn. I'm an electronics professor. I help students learn about computers and electronics. While I don't know how to build a time machine like Dr. Emmett Brown from the movie Back to the Future, I do want to tell the story of a breakthrough that will have profound implications that may be every bit as fantastic. There have been many great inventions throughout history. But what is the greatest invention? Well, I think it is this thing. Before I elaborate on this, I need to explain a little history of why I've come to this conclusion and why I'm so excited by this amazing discovery. There are many different forms of energy, including heat, light, motion, electrical, chemical, and gravitational. There is a lesser known form of energy found throughout the universe that contains far more energy for a given volume than thermal energy. It is because of the wave nature of matter. There is a fundamental lim mathematical limit to the accuracy to which the position of a matter particle and its momentum can be determined. This is due because the matter has a wave nature that makes it fuzzy. It moves around. This is called the uncertainty principle. The existence of zero-point energy is derived from the uncertainty principle. No particle can ever have zero kinetic energy because such a particle would have both a precise position as well as a precise momentum of zero. The uncertainty principle also applies to the electric and magnetic fields that fill all of space. The great inventor and scientist Nikola Tesla delivered a lecture before the Institution of Electrical Engineers in London. Ere many generations pass, our machinery will be driven by a power obtainable at any point in, in the universe. Physicists Richard Feynman and John Wheeler once calculated that the zero-point energy of the vacuum would be orders of magnitude greater than nuclear energy, with the space contained in a light bulb containing enough energy to boil all the world's oceans. The zero-point energy, ZPE for short, is an intrinsic and unavoidable part of quantum physics. It is the random electromagnetic waves that remain after all other energy is removed from a region of space. It was first discovered by physicist Max Planck in 1911 by studying the black body radiation spectrum, the infrared light emitted by any object with thermal motion. We don't notice the zero point energy because we are immersed in it. It is the ground state of matter and energy. It is also theorized by some physicists to cause gravity and inertia. While it is generally acknowledged by most scientists that there is energy present everywhere, the laws of thermodynamics are cited as a reason why ambient thermal energy and zero-point energy is not available for our use. The two relevant laws are the first and second laws of thermodynamics. When I was a physics student, I took a course on thermodynamics. I checked out a book from the college library called The Nature of Thermodynamics by physicist Percy Williams Bridgman. I found these words on page 158 of The Nature of Thermodynamics. Basically, what Dr. Bridgman is asking is, if some kind of apparatus makes use of the differences of temperature and potential that occur spontaneously at the scale of atoms and molecules what we, like what we see with Brownian motion, then is it really violating the second law? Physicists have been debating whether or not some kind of ratchet-like mechanism could exist to extract work from uniform temperatures since the days of James Clerk Maxwell. Basically, microscopic fluctuations might be able to be captured by some sort of microscopic ratchet-like mechanism to do work that is useful at the human mac or macroscopic scale. It has generally been considered that this is impossible and various reasons have been proposed for this conclusion. In fact, the second law of thermodynamics is vigorously defended by most engineers and physicists. However, after reading The Nature of Thermodynamics, I wondered if there were any examples of energy anomalies that might have been discovered in the past. As it turns out, there actually are a number of them which have been largely dismissed or overlooked by mainstream science. In 1875, a man named Wesley Gary demonstrated a mechanism which allegedly furnished its own power, a kind of perpetual motion machine. In around 1925, a fellow named Lester Hendershot discovered that he could create a magnetic oscillation in an iron bar that faced a permanent magnet and, in, and some electromagnet coils. Kohler was able to build and put into operation a small model of the so-called magnet strom apparat, was able to produce a small current and a low voltage ranging from a few millivolts to as much as 12 volts with no source of electricity such as batteries. Another man, Dr. Thomas Henry Moray, Moray exhibited an invention to curious engineers. It could power electrical loads by generating its own energy. Some versions could produce thousands of watts.
Inventions like these are usually dismissed out of hand because they are immediately branded as perpetual motion machines. The second law of thermodynamics is considered to absolutely forbid the possibility of using ambient energy like thermal or zero point energy that has a uniform temperature or potential at normal scales. However, if some kind of apparatus makes use of the difference of temperature or potential that occurs spontaneously, like Brownian motion at the scale of atoms and molecules, then is it really violating the second law? While most of today's engineers and physicists reject the possibility of making use of ambient fluctuation energy, a few brave scientists like Dr. Daniel Sheehan, physics professor from the University of San Diego, do take the position that the second law can be challenged. He has shown experimental evidence that the second law of thermodynamics is not absolute and that the predominant view of thermodynamics is incomplete. He has demonstrated a violation of the second law with an experimental apparatus for testing gas surface reactions called epicatalysis. To quote Dr. Sheehan, The second law has no general theoretical proof, except perhaps for a few idealized cases like dilute ideal gas. Absolute status rests squarely on empirical evidence. As remarked by Enrico Fermi and echoed by others, Support for this law consists mainly in the failure of all efforts that have been made to construct a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. Yet, one would be hard pressed to name any physics theory, concept, or law, or principle that has not undergone major revision either in content or interpretation over the last hundred years. The damning question is, why has it taken so long for the absolute status of the second law of thermodynamics to be questioned? I admire Dr. Sheehan for his bravery in this regard. But he's not the only one. Physicist Dr. Bernard Haish and electrical engineering professor Dr. Garrett, Garrett Modell at the University of Colorado Boulder have demonstrated an experimental low power device that makes use of the Casimir effect in a kind of electronic diode to make use of the zero point energy fluctuations to generate small amounts of electricity. It can be scaled up to higher power output by connecting large numbers of the devices into an array. And then there's Dr. Paul Lebato, a professor of physics at the University of Arkansas. His research has led to rethinking of long-held notions of how the movement of atoms can be used as a source of power. Working with graphene, a one atom thick layer of carbon that moves like a sheet on a clothesline in a breezy day, Dr. Lebato has built a circuit that generates small amounts of power. Decades ago, physicists like Dr. Richard Feynman had predicted that this motion, called Brownian motion, could not be harvested to produce power. Thobato's team found that at room temperature, the thermal motion of graphene does in fact induce an alternating current, or AC, in a circuit, which was able to be converted to direct current, or DC, electricity, by using semiconductor diodes, an achievement thought to be impossible. I noticed that many of the previously mentioned anomalous energy devices used iron and magnetism. Electrons have a property called spin that causes each of them to act like a tiny magnet and allows them to interact with each other in matter, particularly in ferromagnetic materials like iron. Therefore, one fairly obvious candidate for an atomic ratchet mechanism is the interaction of electrons in ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetism occurs in several elements and compounds including iron, nickel, and cobalt. All materials are either attracted to or repelled by a magnet to some degree. Materials that are slightly attracted to magnets are called paramagnetic materials. Materials that are slightly repelled by magnets are called diamagnetic. Most materials this attraction or repulsion is very weak. Ferromagnetism refers to the phenomenon by which ferromagnetic metals such as iron, nickel, cobalt, and certain alloys become magnetized in a magnetic field and retain their magnetism when the field is removed. The magnetic forces due to ferromagnetism are thousands of times stronger than the forces due to paramagnetism or diamagnetism. The magnetic properties come from the additive effect of electron spins. In diamagnetic materials, all the electrons are paired on opposite directions in opposite directions and mostly cancel each other out. In paramagnetic materials, the unpaired electron spins tend to point more in one direction than another, but are subject to fluctuation energy, which tends to knock them out of alignment. So the resulting attraction is weak. 
In ferromagnetic materials, the alignment of unpaired electron spins is held by a strong quantum exchange force, which creates a strong magnetic field due to the greater alignment of the electron spins. To explain the phenomena of ferromagnetism, in 1907 the French physicist Pierre-Ernest Weiss proposed a hypothetical concept of ferromagnetic domains. He postulated that the neighboring atoms of ferromagnetic materials, due to certain mutual exchange interactions, form very small regions called domains in which they all point in the same direction. Weiss assumed that a ferromagnetic specimen contains many small domains which are spontaneously magnetized. The total spontaneous magnetization is the vector sum of the magnetic moments of the individual domains. The spontaneous magnetization of each domain is due to the existence of a strong internal molecular field called the exchange force, which tends to produce parallel alignment of the atomic dipoles. Ferromagnetism is thousands of times stronger than paramagnetism or diamagnetism. Arrows in this picture represents electron spins. Electron spins spontaneously align head to tail in regions called domains because of the strong quantum exchange force. An applied magnetic field will cause some domains with spins in the same direction to grow. Electron spins at the edge of the domains are subject to being realigned by fluctuations from the thermal and zero point energy because they're not held in, spit in place by the exchange force. I believe it is possible to extract useful energy or work from thermal and quantum zero-point energy fluctuations by means of electron spin interactions which are due to the quantum exchange forces in iron and other ferromagnetic materials. This acts as a kind of atomic ratchet mechanism to capture the energy of the fluctuation. When I was in college I wrote a program in the old programming language of Pascal to, to, to simulate the electron spin interactions in ferromagnetic materials. Not a rigorous proof of anything, I believe though that I can see hints of how the electron spin interactions in the ferromagnetism can capture ambient fluctuation energy acting as a kind of ratchet mechanism. This energy has always been in ferromagnetic materials like iron and steel, but it has been wasted by employing field reversals that cause chaos in the electron spins so that the energy is lost. By moving magnetic fields in an orderly fashion, perhaps energy can be captured by the electron spin exchange force to be used to overcome the back force in a generator due to Lenz's law. So here's that program that I, that I wrote this program in around the 1980s. The little arrows represent electron spins in a small region of iron or some other ferromagnetic material. And I believe that this shows that exchange force uh, captures the random some of that random energy so the the random energy that's causing these things to flip which would be the thermal and zero point energy presumably uh, gets captured by the exchange force the ones that are captured are the ones that are in, are locked in between here the ones that are able to change dr. Robert Holcomb is a retired medical doctor who practiced neurology and was a professor at the U U Vanderbilt University School of Medicine he is the prolific inventor who has developed a breakthrough that I think will be one of the greatest inventions in history. I believe it will cause a paradigm shift that will affect almost every aspect of life and will eventually solve many major problems in the world. This invention employs the interaction of electron spins to capture ambient energy fluctuations. The generators shown in this picture are able to produce electrical energy indefinitely without any need for fuel or other external sources of energy. The Holcomb energy device can be run as an energy multiplier or a self-sustaining generator. Dr. Holcomb has been quietly developing this technology for over 15 years after discovering the electron spin energy capture effect. The Holcomb energy system generator uses standard generator and motor winding technology so it can be built without any exotic technology. It is made of the same parts as an ordinary electric motor or generator but it has no moving parts. Ordinary industrial motor control electronics like solid-state relays are, are controlled by industrial computers called programmable logic controllers to sequentially energize the center electromagnets in the device to create a rotating magnetic field with no mechanical motion. Electricity is induced in the other stator coils by the sweeping magnetic fields in the device which gain energy at the atomic level from the electron spin ratchet mechanism due to the quantum exchange force interactions. The Holcomb Energy System, or HES, has no moving parts, unlike conventional synchronous electric generators which have rotors that must be turned by an engine or other mechanical energy source. The HES switches electric current to the electromagnet coils in a stationary iron or, or steel coil. 
This switching action is controlled by a computer, which is the programmable logic controller or other computer. The rotating magnetic fields are created in the core, which are magnetically coupled to a concentric iron cylinder known as the stator. The current is induced in the stationary stator coils as the magnetic field sweeps through them. This is according to the principles of magnetic induction discovered by Michael Faraday in 1831, the same principle used in conventional generators. However, since the HES has no moving parts, there is no back torque, and the Lenz's law is overcome by what Dr. Holcomb calls the energy from the electron spins. Like some of the previously described magnetic energy devices, I believe that the HES employs the phenomena that occurs in iron and other ferromagnetic materials which allows it to capture the microscopic fluctuations that occur at the atomic scale as an energy source using inter in the interactions of electron spins acting as ratchet mechanisms due to the quantum exchange force between the iron atoms. In conventional generators, this captured energy is wasted in the turbulent chaos created by the collapse of the magnetic fields when they are forced to reverse magnetic direction by 180 degrees. The sweeping magnetic fields of the HES avoid the chaos by not collapsing the field, fields and so it is able to make use of the captured energy. It's actually a really brilliant and simple idea. And while there have been a few people in the past that have had similar ideas, Dr. Holcomb is the first to bring this out into practical devices that are actually being used today. The Holcomb Energy System, or HES, can be installed by electricians in a commercial, industrial, or residential installation. The HES can be completely self-powering, but to be less disruptive, it is first marketed as an electrical power-saving device, which will reduce the power bill to a building by at least one half. This version is known as the inline power generator or ILPG. Several of these generators have been installed now in industrial facilities for about three years generating power 24 hours per day. Holcomb Energy Systems is currently making arrangements to have them produced by companies that manufacture electric motors and generators. Hopefully this will provide many much needed jobs for skilled technicians. The Holcomb Energy System HES is a scientific breakthrough in 100% clean energy with no moving parts, solid state. It presents an entirely new source of true electric power generation capable of addressing critical global issues such as climate change, pollution, and universal access to electricity. It will be able to power homes and businesses as well as electric cars and other vehicles like airplanes. Miniaturized versions will be able to power appliances and electronics. You will never need to recharge your devices or vehicles again. This breakthrough represents a major paradigm shift in society. It will affect almost everything. The HES is already powering industrial facilities in the United States. One is a 12,000 square foot manufacturing building and, and two 2,400 square foot commercial facilities, effectively slashing power bills and carbon footprints. I have personally verified this fact. By harnessing energy from the electron spin within iron, the HES eliminates the need for any external source of power, such as wind, solar, fossil, or fossil fuels. The HES devices have been certified by the witness verification companies SGS and DNV. They actually sent people out to test them, and they have documented that. In their, and uh, that's the, what they do for a living, is they verify things, uh, equipment, to make sure that it performs as specified by the manufacturer and to um, perform in a safe manner in accordance with Underwriters Laboratory and the National Electrical Code standards. So indeed, this is very good news for the world. So all kinds of possibilities will come about as soon as people realize this is really possible. The Holcomb Energy System is just the beginning. It is a well-designed and reliable system that uses readily available parts and employs construction methods that are common to the electric motor and generator industry. It will be very exciting to see how things develop. There will be many opportunities that will open up to those who wish to be involved. There will also be many avenues for further research. Including 